so fast that they didn't know what to do with it. And they owned all the railroads and the corporations and uh, the profits uh, rolled in. And in fact, they were making so much money that they decided, look, we've got to protect our gains. We don't want any competition. So these corporations passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, which said you cannot compete with the big corporations. Now, uh, they sold this to Congress. They said, look, we want to have free competition. We don't want any restraint of trade. So we're going to pass the Antitrust Act so there will be no more big trusts in the United States. Everything will be open to everybody. Anybody could start a company and do whatever they want. But actually, the Sherman Antitrust Act in the operation has always been to stifle competition. That these upstart companies, like Bill Gates comes along with Microsoft, uh, and that's why the Justice Department went after him, because this was the true spirit of antitrust, was for the uh, Justice Department to crush Bill Gates, and the, the lawsuit was brought by his own competitors. They said, Bill Gates has too much of the uh, uh, business, so that's a sin. And of course, the Justice Department is against sin, so they went after Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> and even though he was the richest man in the world, uh, the, when the Justice Department went after him, because they could fold him up like a collapsing door because they have so much power, and uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act and all that stuff. <coughs> but what they were trying to do was send Bill Gates a, a message, you're now the richest man in the world, and you're spending a million and a half dollars a year in Washington? This is ridiculous. So, uh, so he got the message, and uh, he's now spending about 50 million a year. <laughs> and uh, because the, uh, the, the criminals, they want you to share. If you're making a lot of money, they want you to share it with them. Just be nice. Don't be selfish. <laughs> and, uh, so that's the whole story of the Justice Department. They want you to be nice. <laughs> and they do it through taxation, and they do it through government force, if that's necessary, and that's what they did. So this is the whole system which was set up in 1694 in England. And what happened was in 1688, England had what they called the Glorious Revolution. And this is part of English history, the Glorious Revolution. What was the Glorious Revolution? The Amsterdam, the Amsterdam bankers, who at that time were the uh, richest people in the world, they controlled most of uh, banking in the world, <coughs> they were very unhappy with King James II of England. They were afraid that uh, uh, his daughter, who had married a Catholic, uh, they were going to have a Catholic king of England, and uh, they didn't want this. So, um, because they didn't want, see, Henry VIII had rebelled against the Catholics and uh, taken away all their lands uh, and uh, created a whole new dukedom, which uh, of the people he gave the uh, Catholic lands to. So, England had been Protestant uh, after that time. So, James II, they thought, my gosh, he's going to go back to a Catholic. So, the Amsterdam bankers decided they had a minor prince in uh, the Netherlands called uh, William. So they decided to finance William, to, uh, who had a claim to the English throne, a very small claim. <coughs> they would finance him to invade England and take it over. Well, the problem was William did not have many troops or many ships. He had by, by no means any amount of military force which he could take over England. So they did it the easy way. They bribed all of King James's admirals and generals to uh, sell him out. And when uh, King William's little flotilla appeared off the coast of England, uh, all of King James's generals and admirals defected to William. So <laughs> he almost won England without firing a shot. And the purpose of all this was they wanted to set up a central bank in England. So, they, so King William uh, set up the Bank of England in 1694. And uh, up to that time, England had, about every 50 years, they'd have a revolution or war, after the Bank of England was set up, there has never been a revolution in England. Because for a revolution, you need, need some money. And once the Bank of England took over the finances of the British Empire, nobody ever had any money to object to anything, and so England has enjoyed uh, tranquility for 300 years. It's that simple. Control the money and you control the people. So. Uh, the bankers realized they needed intelligence, 
So they set up the first and best intelligence operation in the world called the British Secret, in the British Secret in Information Service, SIS. And uh, the purpose of the SIS was not merely to gather intelligence, but also to control the opposition. So if there was any opposition, uh, these intelligence operators would infiltrate it and take it over. This is uh, laid down by a Chinese general named Sun Tzu, who said, always control the opposition. Doesn't matter what it is, uh, it can be the Thursday morning garden club or whatever, but you send agents in and you, t you control it. And in fact, uh, I was very active in uh, right-wing organizations all through the 50s and 60s, and uh, we could always tell a government informant because he would come in and make the biggest donation. And then he would say, look, you guys are not doing anything. Let's get something going here. Let's blow up a building. I'll get the dynamite. It won't cost you a penny. And we'll take care of everything. And these guys would say, hey, this is good. We'll really uh, get something going. So they'd blow up a building, and then they'd all go to prison for life. <laughs> the whole <laughs> because they would have so much uh, testimony against them, they hadn't, when they went to court, they didn't have a chance. And of course, their lawyers would, uh, would never plead entrapment or anything like that. And uh, so these guys were, all, were on the fast track to 30 years in prison. And uh, this is controlling the opposition, and that's how it's done. So the result is there's very little opposition because it's all infiltrated. And you can always tell the government informant because he is the real activist. And he's the one that brings in the money. If you can't pay the rent on the hall, he pays the rent. <laughs> you know, this guy is a real patriot, you know. So, <laughs> and uh, so I saw this from the inside for over 30 years. And, uh, but my work was mostly intellectual, so I wasn't too involved in any of this. But uh, I did make a speech in Coeur d'Alene and uh, uh, Idaho. And I said, I know you Idaho people are great hunters. And, uh, I said, you like to hunt bighorn sheep and you like to hunt cougars and so forth. But I said, I think you're missing a bet. I said, I think that the most thrilling sport of all is hunting federal agents. <laughs> well, two days later, the Murrow building blows up. But, and I never heard a word from anybody to this day. But the Spokane paper did a front page story on me and what I had said, you know. And uh, I thought, well, by gosh, now they're going to say that I blew up the Murrow building. Well, it. <laughs> Nobody to this day ever said anything. I was quoted in the New York Times as saying it's a standard government operation, which of course it was. And I had a friend named Red Beckman in Montana. He was quoted on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that this was a standard government operation, which of course it was, because uh, I know the whole patriot movement in the United States, and I have never met anybody who'd want to blow up the Murrow building. <laughs> I mean, to them, it would be totally counterproductive. Now, if they really wanted to blow up something, they would blow up something in Washington, but they didn't. They went to Heartland America out in Oklahoma where none of the bureaucrats in Washington would be bruised by the bomb going off and uh, blew it up there. And the people in Oklahoma, of course, uh, shed tears. And uh, the government rushed in and leveled the entire building and destroyed all the evidence. And then they con convicted Timothy McVeigh of killing 168 people with no evidence because they had destroyed the evidence. How you convict somebody after destroying all the evidence, I don't know, but they did. <laughs> and uh, McVeigh, of course, was a patsy like uh, Lee Harvey Oswald in the Kennedy assassination, that sort of thing. Because there are always these drifters around, and you can pick them up and uh, uh, do anything you want to with them. They're, they're considered throwaways anyway, <laughs> so, so nobody cares what happens to them. And I don't know what's ever going to happen to Timothy McVeigh. I seriously doubt that he will ever be executed. <coughs> I think they'll just let the American people forget about him and uh, go on. But uh, anyway, to get back to Jekyll Island in 1910, uh, Senator Nelson Aldrich, the chairman of this meeting, was um, the father-in-law of John D. Rockefeller Jr. Now what had happened with John D. Rockefeller, who was financed by the Rothschilds, by the way, so it's really a Rothschild operation, uh, we always were trained to uh, think of the Rockefellers as terrible bandits and uh, unscrupulous uh, oligarchs and so forth. Well, in fact, they're, they're nobodies. The Rockefellers are nobody today in this country. But uh, uh, they, they, they're a convenient whipping boy. So Rockefeller, after the Rothschilds set him up to be the, the biggest monopoly in the world, Standard Oil in New Jersey, uh, they looked around for other fields. 
And so they put him into the medical profession. He revolutionized the medical profession in this country, converted it almost overnight from homeopathy and naturopathy to uh, allopathic medicine. Allopathic medicine, which I describe in my book, Murder by Injection, was a German system which relied on uh, radical surgery, lengthy hospital stays, and heavy use of drugs. When I say drugs, I mean drugs. And uh, so they put the medical profession into the drug business. And uh, that was a Rockefeller operation. Then uh, they decided to use Rockefeller to, to create their central bank and money monopoly. So they set up the National Monetary Commission. In 1907, the bankers in New York precipitated a panic of 1907. And people lost their money and banks closed and there was economic chaos. And uh, so obviously, then the bankers set up a public hue and cry for banking reform. You can read about it in the New York Times of that period. That uh, they said, we must have banking reform. Well, of course, all of the devastation, depredation, was caused by the bankers themselves. I mean, uh, these people who put the money in these banks did not cause the banks to fail. And they didn't want to lose their money, but they lost their money. So banking reform. So Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt set up the uh, National Monetary Commission. And uh, the um, National Monetary Commission was empowered to uh, make recommendations for banking reforms. So the members of this commission, who of course were congressmen, uh, under Nelson Aldrich, the Republican majority leader, they traveled to Europe. They wanted to see how banks worked in Europe. So they were wined and dined by the Rothschilds in Paris and London, and they had a great time for about two years, but they did absolutely nothing. And uh, so people sort of forgot about banking reform. And after they had lulled the people into a total false sense of security, then they took off and went to uh, Jekyll Island, to the Millionaires Club, and uh, secretly drafted their central bank plan, which they called the Aldrich Plan after uh, Nelson Aldrich. Well, of course, the uh, Republicans adopted the Aldrich Plan as their uh, platform in 1912. And the banker-controlled press set up a great hue and cry against the Aldrich Plan as the Wall Street Plan as the big bankers plan. Then they called on Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic candidate, to offer a better plan. So um, Woodrow Wilson put in the Democratic platform in 1912 the Federal Reserve Plan, which he offered as the alternative to the Aldrich Plan. Now the interesting thing was it was exactly the same as the Aldrich Plan, <laughs> but nobody noticed. And so uh, but, but they couldn't elect Woodrow Wilson because he was not a very charismatic person. He was a dull professor. He was not a good speaker. Uh, he was totally unlikable. So he, he was born in my hometown, by the way, of Stanton, Virginia. That's its only, the only claim to fame in Stanton is that I'm from there and Woodrow Wilson was there. Nobody else ever, <laughs> ever amounted to anything. So, uh, <clears throat> so they, they had this task of electing Woodrow Wilson in order to enact the Federal Reserve Act. But unfortunately, William Howard Taft was very uh, well liked. He was the president running for re-election. And um, there was general prosperity. I mean, there's no reason for the American people to trade uh, Taft for Woodrow Wilson. So the bankers called on an old friend, Theodore Roosevelt, who had set up the National Monetary Commission, and said, uh, Ted, we need you to go in and splinter the Republican vote. So Ted Roosevelt comes out of nowhere, starts the Bull Moose Party, runs for president himself, splits the Republican vote. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is a shoe-in, and uh, Taft and Roosevelt, of course, disappear. So now they could have him sign the Federal Reserve Act. But the congressmen from the Middle West and the Far West were totally opposed to even the Federal Reserve Act, because they knew it was a phony. And so uh, they were led by Congressman Charles Augustus Lindbergh uh, of Minnesota. And I've been to his home in Little Falls, Minnesota, and it's a wonderful museum. This man really gave his life to fight the bankers. And of course, he was the father of the aviator. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, Lindbergh 
led the campaign against the Federal Reserve Act. And um, <coughs> so Paul Warburg himself, who was the author of the act, and the other bankers had to, for the first time in their life, come down to Washington and lobby in the halls of Congress to get the Federal Reserve Act passed. And of course, they had to make a lot of promises, a lot of commitments, a lot of bribes. But uh, since they printed the money, it didn't matter. So, so they bribed the Congress to enact the Federal Reserve Act, which was signed, uh, but they still could not get a majority vote. So they had to wait till the Christmas vacation after Lindbergh and the Middle Western and uh, Western congressmen had departed for Christmas vacation. Then they brought the Federal Reserve Act before Congress on December 23rd after the opposition had left. But they still had a quorum, they still could pass it. And so even the New York Times said, never has legislation of such uh, importance been passed under such circumstances. In other words, the whole Federal Reserve Act was passed through fraud, was passed more or less while Congress was in uh, Christmas uh, vacation. And um, so uh, Wilson signed the act into law under, on December 23rd, practically Christmas Eve, uh, and it became public law. So now that they had a central bank with the power to print all the money they wanted, a privately owned bank, and the Federal Reserve Act itself is an amazing act. It's an act of total monopoly because every word in it, first of all, all the money that the, the uh, bankers can print becomes an obligation of the U.S. government, which means the U.S. taxpayer. Second, the stockholders of this private bank uh, included in the legislation that no Federal Reserve Bank stock could ever be bought or sold on any exchange in the world. So in other words, the initial purchasers would own it in perpetuity which is what happened because the Rothschilds, Warburgs, and Schiffs all bought the original stock in 1914 and have owned it ever since. And they've put it into foundations so it can never be touched. And uh, these foundations are the real government of the United States, Rockefeller Foundation. Nearly all of your major legislation in the United States is prepared by these foundations. And they submit it to Congress and of course they have enormous staffs and uh, billions of dollars. So they bring the, the legislation before Congress, and it's impeccable. It's researched and it's phrased and everything is done just right. And uh, so, of course, the Congress accepts it. And they look around and they say, is anybody objected to the, any of this? And, of course, there's total silence. Nobody objects. So it becomes law. <laughs> and that's why you have laws constantly passed by Congress, which are actively opposed by 85% of the American people. Almost everything is done in Washington is opposed by 85% of the American people. So you have government by 15%, government by elites. And they're not even Americans, these are international elitists. They have no allegiance whatsoever to uh, the United States. Just like your Canadian legislatures have no allegiance to you, they have no allegiance to Canada, they're part of the international elite. But of course they don't say this publicly and the press uh, hails them all as great patriots and dedicated people, selfless individuals. They love that word selfless. Imagine, all your legislators are selfless. They never have a selfish bone in their body because they're, they're working for you. They want to give you things. And uh, of course, the only purpose they have is to rob you. Not only you, but all six billion people in the world because it's a government of robbery. So you have what you call the new economy in the United States. And, the, uh, and probably Canada too. And the new economy is simply people working and creating and producing uh, in spite of everything the robbers can do to them. Everything that's accomplished in this country is accomplished in spite of the foundations, in spite of the bankers. Uh, people have to work harder to pay the interest, but uh, they do that. They rise to the challenge, and so they've created a new economy, an economy of enormous prosperity. Uh, and the uh, bankers don't like it because the most influential financial reporter on television in the States is Louis Rekeiser, uh, Wall Street Week, which is a very uh, honored program, been on for many years. So uh, a couple of months ago, I was watching Wall Street Week, and uh, Louis Rekeiser had some uh, Wall Street people on. And uh, uh, 
So he said, well, what do you think about what's going on, that uh, the stock market was dropping, you know? In fact, my stocks were dropping $10,000 a week. Just week after week, I was watching my little nest egg dwindle away, you know? And, uh, but I knew what was going on, and <laughs> I couldn't do anything about it. I may eventually sue Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, for robbing me, because he robbed me. I mean, I, I saw $170,000 in stock vanish into thin air. And the stocks themselves were perfectly good. Every one of these companies was actually doing well. The economy was doing well. And uh, Clinton, of course, was busy in the Oval Office. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he wasn't interfering with any of this, you see. They said, they said listen, Bill, if you'll stay out of your way, you'll have, you can have all the interns you want. And uh, it sounded good to him, and uh, that's what he did. No, Clinton is the invisible president, believe it or not. He has absolutely no political influence whatsoever. And uh, he has a crew in Washington. There was an FBI agent named Gary Aldrich who was stationed there. He was there during the Bush administration, which was a very staid and uh, proper, uh, even stuffy administration. Then in come the Clintons, a bunch of uh, left-wing loonies, uh, homosexuals, and uh, these people were right out of the 1960s. They were absolutely nuts, dope addicts, you name it. None of them could pass uh, a clearance. Most of the Clinton White House staff has never been uh, uh, approved by the FBI. They have no security clearance. <laughs> they should be arrested when they come to work. <laughs> so Gary Aldrich wrote a best-selling book about this. Uh, and um, <clears throat> he told how Hillary, uh, when Christmas came, Hillary was decorating the Christmas trees with uh, penises and condoms and so forth. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these, these people believe in what they're doing. They, they are the real revolutionaries because they're totally degenerate and totally insane. And uh, I don't mean to impugn anybody, but unfortunately, that's what they are. And uh, Gary Aldrich was horrified at these people. And uh, so the whole Clinton spin uh, allied to denounce Gary Aldrich, that uh, he was really a secret Republican and uh, that uh, he, he was... Uh, trying to destroy the Clinton administration. Whenever anybody uh, criticizes Clinton, they call him a Clinton hater. In other words, if you find any fault with Clinton, you must be eaten up with envy and hatred of this wonderful person who's our president, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so Clinton hatred is supposed to be the big thing in the United States. But, uh, well, he'll be long gone because, you see, the powers that be decided to get rid of him, and that's really what Greenspan has been doing. They want to get Clinton and Gore out and put in this very proper Republican administration again. It was the same deal that they did in 1980 with, uh, <coughs> with uh, uh, Reagan. They simply totally sabotaged Jimmy Carter. Uh, they put him on grease skids and ran him right out of Washington. And they're doing the same with Gore. Every, every reporter in the United States knows that Gore is gone, <laughs> that he hasn't got the chance of a snowball in hell. And um, <coughs> so it's, it's Bush all the way. This is the way they, they like unanimity. They like monolithic government. They don't want opposition. So uh, they're going to get rid of uh, Clinton and his gang of bums and uh, put in a very sedate, uh, a nice first lady who has never slept with anybody but her husband. And uh, the whole bit, we're going back to morals. <laughs> Meanwhile, the same bankers will be running everything uh, just as they did. They'll do, be doing everything they want. But at least Bush will not do what Reagan will do. What Reagan did, he brought in this bunch of socialists who called themselves uh, conservatives, or neoconservatives. But uh, Bush is bringing in the old CIA crowd. Remember, uh, Bush Sr. was head of the CIA and uh, was a CIA operative all of his life. Uh, it's the only job he ever had, really. Uh, he had these ships that uh, were CIA uh, passenger ships and everything else, uh, supply ships. And of course, uh, they sabotaged the Bay of Pigs to ensure that Castro, Castro was about to fall in Cuba. He was gone. So they mounted an emergency rest, the CIA mounted an emergency rescue operation to save Castro, called the Bay of Pigs. And of course, all of Castro's opposition came out and fought him because they were assured that planes were coming from the United States and they would blow the Castro forces off the map. So when they went out and were fighting on the beaches, they looked up, there were no planes. No planes ever came. So of course, 
uh, Castro's opposition was totally wiped out and he's been in power ever since. It was the same way that Bush did with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. They said, we've got to get rid of this new Hitler. Saddam is the new Hitler, we've got to get rid of him. So what happened? Saddam is still in power because he and Bush were uh, partners <coughs> in uh, a number of enterprises. Saddam, by the way, is one of the wealthiest men in the world. I mean, he's a big player. And uh, he helps keep the price of oil up. See, people are complaining about the price of gasoline. They don't realize that uh, Saddam is doing that. Because they, if we had the Iraq production coming into this country, gas would be 25 cents a gallon. And so uh, they can't have that. So they keep uh, Saddam in power. And they did the same thing in Iraq. They got rid of all of uh, Saddam's opposition because when the United States attacked Iraq, then obviously every Iraq patriot had to support Saddam Hussein. So he's in for life. <laughs> and uh, that's the way things are done. You always support the opposition so you can control it. So we own Saddam Hussein. He is not a monster that uh, the press claims. And we support Castro. We've kept Castro in power for 40 years. And uh, this is the way they saw it. Well, uh, I, I mention this because the senior Bush, as head of the CIA, oversaw all these things. So what you're going to have under W, the new president, uh, will be a CIA uh, operation, which is the same as in, Ru in Russia, you have the KGB running the state. Here we have, we'll have the CIA running things. <coughs> and um, here again, the people, at some point, the people will have to make themselves uh, recognized. And they're doing this through the internet. The big uh, question mark is the internet. And that's why Washington has been making frantic efforts to control the internet. So they did it through what they call child pornography. Uh, they set up sting operations where uh, guys would uh, try to recruit 12-year-old girls or 12-year-old boys for sex through the internet. And uh, of course this did happen, but it happened because it was a sting operation. There weren't thousands of people out there saying, gosh, I want to get some uh, child sex through the internet. It was, all, it was all set up and they wanted to use this to close down the internet, to have total government control of the internet. Well, unfortunately, it didn't work. Congress passed the law because uh, uh, when you have those $100,000 uh, cash and envelope things, uh, you know, your votes are very easy to get. And so they passed the law controlling the internet, but the Supreme Court threw it out because it was totally unenforceable. And the internet's going to continue to grow and uh, I think people are going to continue to assert themselves. And it's, it's like Kathy said yesterday, we're at the beginning of the new revolution. Everything is opening up and the people are going to have a chance to express themselves and to uh, have government control. Because the criminals have exhausted all of their criminal operations. They have all the money, they have all the political power, and yet they're on the way out because time itself is against them. Uh, information is against them. The wheel is turning around. And uh, these people are going to be gone. I'm telling you, within 10 years, these banking people are going to be gone. My book came out in 1953, has been uh, on the Federal Reserve, has sold over a million copies. There's been eight complete plagiarized editions published by other people. 